Hi there. Hi folks. Well, in part two of this video, um, we're going to look at uh, diagnosing engine problems. Um, and the time when you're most likely to be able to diagnose a problem or know you have a problem is when you start your engine. So what we've done is we've put together a engine pre-start list and we've given some explanations of why we do those checks. So as part of this video we're now going to show you how we do these checks and what we're looking for and why we're looking for it. So what's the first item Cindy? Check the oil level on the dipstick. It should be between the upper and lower limits. Beware of high oil levels, this can indicate water in the oil or fuel. Some of them are pretty important, some not so important. There's, uh, we've done them in chronological order as you would start your engine and uh, hopefully this will be of use to you all. You can go to our website svmpavidus.com, go to downloads and we will put this uh, pre-start list on there as a download as a PDF for you so that you can download it and um, stick it in the engine bay or just use it as a reference document. So there's no charge, no no fees, nothing like that. Um, just to say if you do download it and uh, give it to people, just credit us or, um, or buy us a beer. <laughs> okay, so I'll go to the engine bay, turn the other camera on, and Cindy's going to read off the, uh, the items as we go through. Okay. Right, so other camera's on. This is our engine bay. Hopefully uh, we've got some light there and you can see what's going on, but uh, I'll try and zoom in where I can. So what's the first item, Cindy? Check the oil level on the dipstick. It should be between the upper and lower limits. Beware of high oil levels. This can indicate water in the oil or fuel in the oil. Okay. And top up. And top up as necessary. As okay, so our dipstick is here. Our engine hasn't been started for a while. I'm just gonna wipe our dipstick off, put it back in again, and our oil level is just below, I think you can see that, I'm about to drip oil, just below the top and bottom marks. So as Cindy said, if your oil level appears to be increasing, it can be a telltale that you've got water going into the engine. Um, and that can be um, because your anti-siphon valve is not working properly and you've siphoned water into the exhaust and then that's gone through an inlet manifold. I'll put a little diagram here um, and show you how that can get in. Um, the other thing is that you can have weeping injectors or leaking injectors. The diesel will then weep into the top of the uh, combustion chamber and go down the sides of the piston and the piston rings and into the oil and what that will do is that will increase the level of the oil so it's quite important that if you see your oil level rising from one day to the next that you investigate why that is and I'll drip oil on the floor what was number two Cindy Number two, check the oil filler cap for emulsified oil, which is white or a yellow paste. Okay, so this is again quite important. If you're topping up your oil, you're going to need to remove your oil filler cap. And this is usually on the top of the engine. And what you want to look for is inside the oil cap, oil filler cap, that there is no white, um, like a paste, a whitey yellowy paste um, looks a bit like mayonnaise. If you've got that in there, then that's a telltale sign that you've got um, water in your engine. It may be fresh water, it may be coolant, it may be salt water, um, but you need to investigate that. So just one of those regular things to do, check the oil filler cap and make sure it's clean. 
make sure there's no emulsified oil in there make sure the o-ring's okay and you can do that when you top your oil up so that's how we do that what's the next one cindy number three gearbox oil check look for water ingress or higher than expected levels or discolored oil okay so most uh, modern boats have sail drives but some still have um, a shaft drive now your gearbox quite often will be cooled as well with a heat exchanger and what you're looking for is you're looking again for oil levels that have come up which would indicate that something is is getting into the oil and bringing it up um, and the same as your engine when when the oil comes up what's actually happening is the oil is floating on top of the water because it's less dense and it's giving you a false high reading what you're actually doing is you're reading the depth of water in the sump or in the gearbox plus the oil so it's a really good indicator that you've got a seal gone or something is amiss now our uh, gearbox oil is right over the back of the engine um, and i'm sure you don't want to see my backside um, doing a full moon let's see if i can get in there and just check it now we did actually check this the other day when we serviced the engine and you can see our oil is clean no emulsification uh, uh, mayonnaise on the top there nice clean oil let's just put it back in and check the depth And again, just between the top and the bottom marks on that dipstick. Again, we've got an O-ring there, just check that's okay, which it is. And then we can put that one back. That's our gearbox and drive leg oil checked. What's the next one, Cindy? Number four, raw water filter check, then reprime if necessary. Okay, so. Um, sometimes it's called a strainer, it's a, a raw water uh, strainer or a raw water filter. Now, as it's always tight, and obviously it's salt water, so what happens is when you take the lid off, you just want to be aware that that salt water, you don't want to drip it all over the engine. Just wipe that O-ring off carefully. Oh, you're rattling away well and there's our basket and as you can see it's a bit discolored but it's clean now that locates back in there and sits down repriming now our strainer is well above our water level on the outside of the boat our water level on it on this boat is about here at the top of the engine you can just see the water level there now before we put the lid back on we need to prime that piece of hose because the pump will be drawing in air for a little while and because this is so high we need to top this up and just prime it and you'll find that on a lot of modern engines you need to reprime the raw water strainer or filter before you start the engine now if I was to pour water straight down there it will go back down the inlet hose, out the bottom of the leg, and be absolutely no use at all for priming. So what we have to do is turn off our raw water valve, which is down here, and then we top the raw water strainer box up. Here's a kettle I've heard earlier. Now the level in there has gone up, just check the top, make sure that o-ring is going to seat properly, put that back on, and now we can reopen the raw water inlet uh, which will allow the water to flow back down that pipe but it will actually be full to the water level, if that makes sense. Quite important on some of these modern engines, 
uh, the way in which they're installed. So I can now open that valve. And we know that that is now primed and full of water. What's the next one, Cindy? Yeah. Uh, the raw water pump and hoses check. Okay, so on these, uh, on this particular engine, our raw water pump is at the front. You know, you've, we've we've done the servicing, how to service that. What we're looking for is around the back of the pump. There are two opposing uh, lip seals. One keeps the oil in the engine, and the other one keeps the water in the pump. If those start to degrade or break down, you will have either water or oil dripping from the back of the pump. It's an easy fix. It's in one of our other videos. In fact, I think it's in two of our videos. But we're just looking for any leaks, any oil. Look around the clamps, make sure they're not leaking. Check the hoses visually, make sure there's no leaks. And down to the heat exchanger. Um, one of the things that's really important of course is when you keep your engine clean if you have got a leak you'll see it straight away as soon as you uh, start doing a visual inspection so we're okay on that one Cindy what's the next one uh, check the coolant level and then for any leaks in the hoses or towel ends on this engine we've put our coolant header tank up a little bit higher than the heat exchanger previously it was mounted down the front and the reason we've done that is that it stops uh, air being trapped in the heat exchanger and gives you the full um, the full internal volume of the heat exchanger uh, full of coolant there's no airlocks or anything in there so if you look here our coolants there it's just in between the minimum and the maximum marks there's no coolant leaking out of here there's none around the coolant pump the hoses are good there's no coolant around the bottom or around the back. Uh, our coolant doesn't need topping up, it's all okay. So that's that check done. What's the next one, Cindy? Uh, the electrical check, the cables and insulation connections. Okay, so one of, the, one of the things that we're looking for is we're looking for connections around the uh, splitters here this is our charge splitter this splits off the charge from our alternator to our domestic batteries our starter battery which is under here and our bell thruster battery um, so they're all looking good um, one place in particular that you need to look at is down the side of the engine on the starter motor make sure that there's no corrosion around the starter motor cables and that's the usually the big red one the positive is the one that you get a bit of corrosion around but also there's a small wire on the back of most starter motors um, which is the energizer cable for the solenoid and those corrode and you cannot see them corroding because they're usually uh, covered in heat shrink or they're on one of these little spade clips and one of the things that happens is when they corrode inside you don't see it you go to start your engine and you think your batteries are flat because you get this click 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 of the solenoid and what that is is it's not the starter motor or solenoid that's a problem it's that one little connection and I've seen people go off and buy new batteries or go and buy a new starter motor fit them and have exactly the same problem so you need to check that those cables aren't, haven't got uh, salt corrosion on them, that they're well made. We can actually get in the side of our engine here through our heads and check all of those things out. You don't need to do it every time, but it's good practice to keep an eye on it every two or three weeks or so. So, no issues with corrosion in here, nice and clean and tidy, and all our connections are okay. What's the next one, Cindy? Uh, the belts and tension check. As ah. you would see in the manual. Right, so we have serpentine belts or multi V groove belts on this engine that drive our 130 amp alternator. We don't have any auxiliary drives for a fridge or a compressor or um, uh, hydraulic pumps or anything, so we only have a single belt. 
but you may have more than one belt on your engine. These belts need to be kept in good condition. They need to be tight, but not over tight. Um, and generally, just on the longest side, which is either this one here at the top or the one at the bottom, they should be able to move with light finger pressure, um, half an inch, no more, um, 10, 10 to 12 centimeters, no more than that. You can do more damage by over tightening the belt uh, than having it too loose. If it's too loose, it will slip, but if it's over tight, you'll damage the bearings in the coolant pump and you'll damage the bearings in your alternator or your auxiliary drives. So don't go mad over tightening it. Um, this one's good. It's, uh, it's actually been on there five years now, so that shows you that, uh, that belts can be made to last. Uh, five years is good and it's still not got any cracks, any crazing, and it's not shiny and worn. So, yep, we've got a good belt there. Our alternator is nice and firm, solid on the top there. There's no movement, nothing in the adjusters. I'm quite happy with that. What's the next one, Cindy? Uh, the shut-off cable or the emergency stop. Ah, right. Now, uh, there's, there's two different types. Uh, of problem. The first problem is if you have a conventional uh, cable which goes to a shut off valve on your diesel pump and that um, breaks or slides or slips what happens is you can get your engine out of gear but you can't stop your engine. So we don't have that on this engine we have an electronic solenoid which allows the fuel on or off to start and stop the engine. Should that solenoid fail in the open condition, we wouldn't be able to stop our engine. And so down here, if you can just see that, there is an emergency stop lever on the pump. If the engine won't stop and that it's been through an electrical fault, then we can come down, open the Bombay doors, and uh, just push that lever over to stop the engine and that works okay we know that works okay um, I did actually stop the engine with it the other day when I was working on my own so it's in good condition it's working and it's free and ours is actually marked uh, with emergency stop what's the next one Cindy? Uh, the throttle and gear linkage checks okay throttle and gear linkage um, I would say that the gear linkage is probably the most important of these two and here's the reason you're coming into a berth or coming into a mooring or a dock and you're in gear in forward gear and you take it out of gear to the neutral position and nothing happens you have no way of stopping your boat unless you can stop the engine because the gearbox will remain engaged in whatever uh, position it is, either in forward or reverse or even in neutral. Now as is, is on the back of the engine, down by a gearbox, and it's one of those things that we check regularly. Um, I'll see if I can put a little insert picture down here somewhere to show you how it works. And the other one of course is your throttle linkage. So on as it comes directly through an isolation clamp as most Volvo sail drives do because the sail drive on Volvos are isolated from the engine um, electrically to, to, uh, to stop uh, corrosion uh, galvanic action so this one is good here on the throttle it's not moved little isolation rubbers are in position the clamp back here is good there's no movement there and I'll just check our gearbox one yep that's good little split pins still in there everything's tight nothing wobbling so that's quite an important check I've seen boats or we've seen boats haven't we and particularly a, a big power boat in I think it was in Port Solent a few years ago 10-12 years ago a uh, gentleman came in, 
using both these engines to position his motorboat in the right place uh, as he came into the dock. One of the gearbox cables came loose, came off the engine, uh, off the gearbox, and he then proceeded at about three quarter throttle, half throttle, to go up the pontoon and uh, knocked out all the electric for the pontoon. Quite funny, wasn't it? Well, not funny for him, I suppose. But those simple checks will just, uh, just allow you not to be embarrassed when you're manoeuvring into position. So what's the next one, Cindy? Uh, the engine mounts and the drive linkage check. Okay, so we have direct drive. Our gearbox is connected directly to our sail drive. If you're on a boat with a shaft, you will know that you have two flanges or um, a very drive, but there will be a connection between the gearbox and the shaft. And quite often those things are overlooked. So on a regular basis, and it doesn't need to be every time you start your engine, you just need to check for loose bolts, make sure the alignment's okay, make sure everything is working or looking as it should be. Um, also, if you have a shaft, obviously you're going to have a shaft seal, and you need to be looking for drips or, or leakage around that. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, some of these shaft seals uh, have, uh, they're called dripless. Um, they're not always dripless, but you need to keep an eye on how much they are or are not dripping. On ours, our drive is directly to our uh, flywheel um, via um, percussion plate. Um, so we can't actually inspect that. But shaft drives, yeah, something else you need to look at. The other thing is that our engine is mounted on two engine mounts at the front, and then the third engine mount is actually on the back of the gearbox. And that's what allows the engine to be moved around with the sail drive. The sail drive connected directly. Um, so if you have uh, loose bolts, on your engine mounts or the one at the back just a regular inspection make sure they're okay if your engines vibrating quite a lot when you run it you might find that the vulcanization between the rubber mounts and the bolt has come undone and you've then got to replace your engine mount obviously on a, a shaft drive boat uh, fiddling with the engine mountings will change the alignment between the shaft and the engine so just be aware if you're going to change engine mounts on a shaft drive boat that you will need to realign the engine and that's something you should do fairly regularly to uh, check just make sure that your alignment's good otherwise you'll run your cutlass bearing out uh, either inside your outer shaft or on your p-bracket so we're all good here all in good condition bit of dust on there but otherwise we're okay what's the next one Cindy put check the fuel is switched on and visually check the fuel lines and water separator okay so our fuel cutoff switch is in our aft cabin uh, I believe the reason they've done that is that should there be an engine fire you don't need to open this hatch to switch the fuel off you can do it without opening the hatch so I've just turned that on, I know that's okay. And the other thing was, sorry, fuel and... The water separator. Done the water separator, ah, right, water separator, yeah. So in the back of our engine bay, we have a primary filter with a water separator and it's got a little glass bowl in the bottom. Uh, we check that just visually every now and then. Yeah, that's okay, we've got clean fuel in there. If you've got one of the Rayco ones and it's up a bit higher, you'll probably be able to see it better than we can on ours. But uh, yeah, that's an indication that you've got water in your fuel and that your separator's having to pull it out. So keep an eye on those. If you've got one of the CAV type primary filters, there's a little drain plug on the bottom. Um, and it's a good idea, you know, once a month or so, maybe more frequently, just to drain the filter bowl off the bottom and check that you haven't got water or bits and pieces in there. Um, if you have, 
then you have one of two problems. Either you've got condensation forming in the tank um, or you have water being put into the tank and that can happen in two ways. Either the O-ring on your fuel filler is allowing salt water or rain water to get past the filler cap or you've been given some dodgy fuel. Um, we have a filter that we can put our diesel through which separates the diesel from any muck or any water um, and that that's the prime thing is to not actually have the water being put in the tank in the first place. So on our boat the heater plugs are fully automatic via a timed relay on the side of the engine. On some boats you may have to push a, a button to use your heater plugs. Don't use them excessively, they'll actually glow white hot if you use them for too long. Your manual should tell you uh, the length of time you need to activate them and it's usually somewhere between 5 and 10 seconds. So to start our engine all we have to do is push our start button and then we're going to do a couple of checks. Now your engine should start within three to five seconds. I'm going to stop airs just for a minute and explain why you shouldn't keep pushing the start button. Let me show you in the diagram. So from previous videos you know that your seawater pump is driven directly from your engine either on the crankshaft or via a pulley. If you continue to start the engine, rotate it, that pump will continue to pump water through the system. Eventually it will fill up your exhaust hose and then flow back through the exhaust manifold and into the engine. So just for illustration purposes you can hear that uh, alarm going off. When I stop the engine using this button here there's obviously no oil pressure and uh, the ignition's on so the alarm has come on and I can either stop that by hitting the alarm button or by turning the start circuits off. So I'm going to go through the start sequence on our boat. It's just running through its self-diagnostics. Two bleeps means that all the alarms are okay and we're ready to start. Three or four seconds and the engine bursts into life. We're ticking over okay and our engine hours are 1434.9. So I'll put that in the log as 1434 uh, sorry 1435 because we're going to run it for five ten minutes and just make sure everything's okay and the next thing we're going to be looking for let's go over the back of the boat is we've got water coming out the exhaust and there's plenty of it and we're now going to let the engine warm up lovely sunny day here in Licata a bit chilly a lovely sunny day. Right, let's go to the next item on our checklist. Okay, so we've just been through outside starting the engine and the sequence that we use for. What I wanted to do is come back out of the wind um, and tell you some of the things that you should look for when you're starting your engine. Well, obviously, the water that we've seen coming out the exhaust, if you've got a dry exhaust, you will normally have a telltale which will put water out somewhere or a pressure switch which will, which will tell you that your raw water system is pressurised and you've actually got um, raw water going through your heat exchanger uh, and exchanging heat with the, with the um, engine coolant. Um, again we've been through that on a previous uh, video so uh, I'll see if I can put a link down here somewhere to to engine cooling so that you can have a look at that and, uh, within three to five seconds of you starting the engine if you've got a water cooled exhaust you should have a very reasonable amount of water coming out uh, it shouldn't be just a dribble um, and lastly um, all engines all all four-stroke engines 
will give a slight puff of smoke when you start them. Um, it's not unusual, it's part of the cold uh, starting process that some of the fuel might not be burnt and you might have a little puff of, of, of dark um, smoke, black smoke or a little puff of white smoke but it certainly shouldn't go on. Um, if you've got excessive smoke after starting your engine I would say probably 30 seconds to a minute after starting uh, and there is some form of smoke coming out either blue smoke from burning oil uh, white smoke from uh, incomplete burn or black smoke from uh, over fueling then you really need to look at that because if you're over fueling you can get diesel um, around the rings and down into the oil which will make your oil level go up um, if you're not burning your fuel efficiently you're getting white smoke uh, and the air is being suffocated from your engine from uh, a blocked air filter or uh, or indeed by an exhaust elbow that's blocked or partially blocked then you really need to look at that because as smoke is a telltale sign that something is wrong that you're not getting a good burn inside your engine not only can you do damage to the engine but you can cause something catastrophic uh, by continuing to run that engine when you've got excessive smoke um, and finally really one of the most important things we would say um, about looking after your diesel engine in your boat you need to do visual checks um, you know it, it takes you five minutes just to look around the engine uh, you know touch things run your hands around it pieces of cloth make sure you haven't got any leaks um, make sure there's no water in the bilge that's coming from somewhere um, and keeping a clean engine bay if you keep a clean engine bay you will see these things happening way before they become a major problem um, and it's invariably when you need to rely on your engine that um, not taking notice not doing the right maintenance not doing visual checks will bite you on the backside um, so from here on Impavidus me and my shiny head in the sun um, We'd like to say thanks for watching. Uh, thanks to our patrons. You guys are great. We couldn't do these videos without your patronage. Um, thanks to our subscribers. And if you're not a subscriber, go down and, and hit the subscribe button. It's on our logo, which I think is down there or down there somewhere. Um, it makes a difference. Um, don't forget to hit the thumbs up. Uh, give us a like. And if this video has been useful to you, pop over to our website and download the engine starting um, spreadsheet or, that we've done. It might just be helpful to you. And uh, if we can pass a bit of knowledge on and make something useful to you, well, that's what we're all about here on Impavidus. So from now, from me and from Cindy, who's over there, no, I'm over here now. You're over here Bye. now. <laughs> Bye, folks. Bye. Thanks for watching. Sail safe. <laughs>